Dude, Just I make sure. I click the streaming button. Okay, sweet. So we're live. I just got sure, to make sure that, that I don't sound too Australian. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, we need to wait a couple of uh, minutes because usually yep. it takes uh, two or three minutes for people to tune in. Yeah. But this is always the most exciting part because you start <laughs> seeing people coming up, you know, saying hi yep. and, you know, hopefully there will be people with questions related to the yep. topic. I don't know, did you share the video with your community down there? Yeah, I did. I, uh, so I've got a couple of Thai guys that I've shared it with. Uh, the guys at work at Deocrit, I've sent the link on Facebook to them. So hopefully, well, I mean, it's getting a bit late over here now. So yeah. they might be in bed because they've <laughs> been working all day pretty hard. So, But, you know, if you, if you keep talking with your with your AMSR voice will be the best way to put them to sleep. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> good evening. You <laughs> got, yeah, you got a really stereophonic uh, voice. Okay, so I see there are already a couple of people. Jakub, uh, Jakub uh, Yosmar, hey, what's happening, guys? Uh, about 10 people watching already. It's only okay. 35 seconds. I like the fact that, you know... Uh, the new recruits that are coming to the channel are very motivated and they cannot wait to to uh, uh martin it's also here very nice okay so it's already a bunch of people watching and it's only right. a minute in i think we yeah. could actually start with this sure let's, uh, let's how do you feel I mean, yeah no i feel good uh, <laughs> I, I know that there's going to be a lot of guys in australia tomorrow morning like probably watching it and, and because it's uh, yeah, well, three o'clock in the morning over there, so <laughs> we missed the Aussie uh, channel, but that's okay. <laughs> hi, Frank. A lot of people tuning in saying hi. Uh, okay, so before we start with the interview, Zach, f first of all, I want to thank you for taking the time. I wanted no, no, to talk no. to you for a while now uh, yep. because you know you have this very interesting story, and in the past, you know, we kind of like. 3D flirted, so to say, you know, sharing stories and sharing uh, interest, so to say, over the Facebook. Um, yeah. I, Nick, nice seeing you. So it's so, so already a very big bunch of people watching. And I, will, I was always very fascinated by your uh, professional path because, you know, you did quite a big tour and lately you ended up working in Thailand. I visited yes. Thailand a couple of years ago with my wife and I absolutely loved it. And I, you know, I was always wondering what it's like to live there, what it's like to work there as a 3D artist. Uh, yeah, sure. So, you know, now I have a guy that can talk about this stuff. Why don't we do a little introduction about yourself? Why don't you tell us who you are, uh, yep. how you got there? And then I'll ask you a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, so I'm Zach Arado. Uh, I'm a creative visualization artist, uh, creative director, and uh, now most recently uh, technical and innovation developer for uh, Deacrit here based in Bangkok. Uh, started my career uh, 1996. Uh, so a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I started off using Lightweight 3D, Maya, and then eventually Max and V-Ray uh, once I got into the ArcViz industry and just sort of went from there. Yeah. Where did you... So basically, uh, you started as an artist, right? And that was in Australia. I did. I, yeah. Uh, so in 1996, I went into university. I uh, was studying multimedia and i uh, started off with lightwave 3d uh, 5.6 and but a you're a later, very young guy how old are you suck me i'm 42. <laughs> For, oh you look a lot younger i would have thought Thank we you. were the same age but okay <laughs> no i've been around for a while <laughs> um so yeah I, uh, I i ended up actually teaching uh, 3d at university uh, after my first semester of learning 3d i went back and and started training some young guys and uh, a couple of those guys now work in the, the film industry and, and work for, for Animal Logic and Method Studios. So I keep in contact with those guys and uh, follow their careers quite closely as well. And they're good mates. Um, but then 
I spent my first couple of years, I guess, out of university working uh, in between sort of multimedia projects, so uh, CD-ROM uh, animation uh, for education and then also uh, a short stint in the uh, VFX industry uh, working for a couple of guys uh, on the Gold Coast. And I kind of tried to get into the VFX industry down in Melbourne, but there wasn't a lot of jobs going at that time. Um, when I went down to Melbourne at that time, they all said, no, no, go back to Queensland. That's where all the jobs are. Like, nah, <laughs> so um, I ended up working for a, a couple of professional photographers, uh, so uh, doing photo retouching and um, uh, doing some uh, actual photography uh, for those guys and then landed a, my first gig, I guess, in architectural visualization around about 2004. And that was where? Uh, that was in Melbourne, uh, and that was with uh, Orbit Solutions. Okay. But and I also know that you spent a little bit of time working, you know, at Binion. You're yes. probably like the <laughs> 100th person that I talked that worked there. Yep, yep. So I, I, I was at Binion for around about eight, nine months or something like that. Um, uh, how that position came around was um, I had just resigned from a, a position as the creative director uh, at another studio and I was sort of looking around for my next role and uh, I was speaking to a, a good friend of mine who's a recruitment agent and uh, she said, oh, you know, why don't you have a look at Binyan? And I thought, oh well, I know Andre. Um, I had uh, sort of heard about Chris and Andre a few years beforehand um, from uh, the Tower Melbourne project uh, that Chris did the uh, the exterior render and that went on the front cover of the uh, the Melbourne newspaper. Uh, I ended up actually doing the uh, the video uh, like the film animation for for that project and uh, yeah it, it got leaked to the press a little bit early <laughs> it wasn't supposed to but it did. <laughs> Uh, I think I still got a copy of that uh, newspaper uh, render that Chris did um, uh, back at home in the box. So, uh, but yeah, I, I, um, so I had a phone interview with uh, Andre on a Saturday night, and uh, he was like, "Okay, uh, well, that sounds pretty good. Um, can you, when, when can you come to Sydney? Can you come to Sydney on Monday?" And I was like, uh, "Yeah, <laughs> uh, let, let's." Uh, Give me a day. <laughs> so I ended up actually starting work on the Tuesday, uh, straight after the phone interview with, uh, with Andre. And, uh, I spent a, uh, my first month uh, at Binyan uh, up in Sydney. And uh, I know you uh, you talked to Martin recently, and uh, Martin had just started just before me. And so I was kind of sitting in between Martin, Flo, and Mirko at, uh, at Binyan. And, you know, uh, it's like a big family. It is. It is massively. Um, you know, we had a we had a lot of fun. Uh, you know, we were all working together, and those guys are uh, amazing talent. So, even sort of with the experience that I'd had by the time I joined Binyan, um, you know, I've learned so much more uh, mm -hmm. from those guys uh, and from Chris himself as well, and uh, and from Dave Butterworth, who's now the uh, CGI director, uh, sorry, creative director over in uh, New York. And, you know, I still keep in contact with all the guys in Melbourne as well. So, yeah, it, it, it is very much a big family. And, uh, and I mean, that's one of the, uh, the beauties that I, I liked about working for, uh, for them. That was great. So uh, how did this shift or this move from, you know, Australia to Thailand happen? Right. So after like I sort of left Binyan, I was working for a, a small uh, architectural firm uh, that was doing museum work. And uh, after that sort of contract ended, I was looking around for my next sort of role on, on what I wanted to do. And the guy who was the director of uh, the new construction team up here at the time, uh, Peter, he and I actually, and another uh, friend of ours, we tried launching a uh, an ArcVis conference back in 2004. So we, we sort of worked loosely together, um, you know, try, trying to do that. And then um, we stayed in contact and he 
moved up to Singapore for a few years and then he got offered the role here as uh, the director of uh, new construction. And he sort of said, um, I'm looking around for, you know, someone to be the, the new creative director here at uh, Deercrit. Uh, would you be interested in the role? And I said, absolutely. Why not? Uh, I'd been to Thailand, you know, six months uh, prior and just on holidays. And so uh, I knew what Bangkok was like and I knew what the, the lifestyle was like. So I thought, okay. Pack my bags and go. <laughs> now I'm gonna ask you, you know, a yeah. kind of personal question because um, um, very often when I talk to people, they come to me and say, you know, I need to go and move to another country, but I don't feel like it because you know I'm leaving behind my parents, I'm leaving behind my friends. Uh, yeah. Now certain countries, like say Italy, when I did move away, I did it out of necessity. I don't think yeah. Australia is the place where, you know, you move out of necessity. There is a good economy. It's a very stable um, uh, economy. You know, it seems like you guys don't have major issues. You made the change. Um, was it something also that you thought from a personal level could help you to grow? Um, was it hard for you to leave family and friends behind? Can you give me a little uh, bit more of a picture about yeah, this? Because sure, it's sure, a... Sure. I like to share also that personal side with people listening. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I had all my friends and family uh, down in Australia, of course. And so for me to just uh, pack a suitcase and go, it wasn't like a, an easy sort of decision. It wasn't like just, uh, yes, I'm going to go. And one week later, I was on a plane. It took about two months to actually organize everything anyway with the work permits and the visas. So I had a, a little bit of time to sort of, uh, prepare everybody else, like all my friends and family, that, yeah, okay, look, I'm going to go to Thailand. I'm going to go and give this a, a go and see what happens and um, at least give it 12 months and, and, and we'll work it out from there. Um, and, yeah, it, it's, it's a difficult thing, but it's also a very exciting and rewarding thing to, you know, move out of your comfort zone and, and move to another country. Um, And it's also a very personal challenge to do it too because you're moving to another country where, like, I didn't know anybody here apart from Pete. Uh, and you know, he had a family here, so I wasn't hanging out with him every weekend. And I was seeing him five days in the office anyway. That's where so, I wanted to get to, you know, yeah, like, yeah. because it is hard. But, yeah, it is hard. Um, one of the, I guess, one of the big things here in Bangkok is the, there's a very strong expat community that uh, you can go and join different groups. There's meetups, there's uh, internations. So it's very easy to sort of go along to those. And, and I've met a great bunch of friends out of the internations group over here. Uh, I've met Australians, English guys, uh, French, and we hang out and, you know, we'll go on uh, just have beers on the weekend, watch some football. Yeah, and it, it's really good. Um, like when I first got here, I was hanging out with some of the people from work, but then I slowly sort of tapered off and I, you know, we went, uh, well, there's still people that I hang out from the office, uh, but because I see them five days a week, we don't hang out every single weekend. I go and catch up with my other friends. Um, but in terms of making new friends here in Bangkok, because there is such a large expat community, it is very easy to sort of, yeah, meet other people and hang out. And there's also a lot to explore as well. So, yeah. That's uh, the, you know, that's a comforting thing at least to, to, to hear. Uh, one more question. From yeah, sure. a, uh, a cultural point of view, mm -hmm. uh, Talking about work, what were the biggest challenges, like, you know, going there and have to adapt to maybe a different uh, working culture? Because I have absolutely no idea how things are done in Thailand. And, you know, I want to take also the chance to invite, uh, I know that there is a Mio watching with Taya also, you know, feel free to contribute if you're listening to, to this Uh, to this chat right. and maybe you know we can compare the the uh, uh what you say with what they have to say but please yeah uh, yeah sure uh Widia is, is watching i heard you mention so 
How's it going on? Um, he, he's a very talented artist. I am uh, butchering I, their names and I apologize. You know, it's no, a, no, it's okay. Uh, I, I had an absolute pleasure working with Whittier and uh, he's been featured on Ronan Beckerman yeah. uh, several times. And yeah, he, He's an he incredible artist. Time. Yeah, he is. He's a, he's a very, very, very talented artist. So, um, so you know, working with those guys, um, the, the cultural differences, I wouldn't say there's a lot. Um, there's certainly a different pace to how things are done here in Thailand. Uh, it's it's not the okay. Binyan is a is a very fast paced studio, and it's a big operation, so it has to be. <laughs> um, but Australia in general, I, I think, has a, a very a very uh, sort of quick pace to it in the way that it's uh, you know, producing stuff. Uh, I think part of the reason of that is simply because the the, the high cost of living and the expense that it is down there. So it's a, a little bit more expensive to, to produce things than it is say, up here in uh, Thailand. Um, with that said, you know, our production times are pretty much on par with what those guys are doing down there anyway. Um, but it's probably, a, a, we're, well, we're doing different things. Uh, we're not doing the same sort of level of uh, projects that I would say that Binyam would do. Uh, we're, we're doing, well, Deercrit, for instance, uh, has targeted the Nordic market. So we don't actually do any work in Thailand as such. Uh, it's mainly the Nordics uh, where our customer base is. Um, so, you know, our competitors up there, at the top level, you've got, got guys like Mia and uh, the Tomorrow Agency. Um, and again, we're, we're playing with sort of those, that, that sort of field of competition. Um, and we're starting to sort of bring our level of work up to that speed as well. Uh, and the only way that you can do that uh, down here is to be you know, very efficient in sort of having good systems in place, good creative direction. Clients who are clients, they're, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, can you change this right at the last minute? It's like, oh, yeah, okay, the, the pillows aren't fluffy enough. Yes, okay, sure, we've just like rendered all of the images, but sure, we can make your p pillows more fluffy. <laughs> <laughs> you need uh, to have a 3D person, an animation that goes to the pillow and that's with the pillow. Tf, tf, tf. Yeah, just fluffy. <laughs> <laughs> now it's fluffy. <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, culturally wise, um, there's not a lot of difference uh, really between, you know, the, the working culture uh, between like say a Thai studio and an Aussie studio or even like an Italian studio. Uh, I, I think pretty much it's a universal sort of working culture. We were, we're working as teams, we're working as, you know, friends. Um, we're not competing against each other in any way if someone gets stuck on an issue someone else jumps in to solve the or help them solve the issue uh which is great to see uh, now let me ask you if somebody say um wants to do that job in thailand um yep. what do they can expect to be paid and how can we compare this to say I'm not trying to be personal, you know, no, no, like no, asking no, you. No, no, no. Um, but like I'm interested because, you know, I did a couple of surveys in the past and yeah. uh, it was uh, staggering to me that some people doing this job, which is a qualified job, they yeah. were actually asking for the same amount of money that you would get, say, working in a coffee shop or, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. But I'm talking okay. about prices in Thailand. So like a yeah. person in Thailand will make, I don't know, I think that the last time that I asked was like uh, uh, $300 a month or something. And they okay. would it's ask... Not, it's not quite that cheap. But, uh, and, that, and they would ask for that amount, for the same amount of money uh, to work as a 3D artist. And I was like, this is a little bit weird to me, you know, that they wouldn't go for a more qualified salary but anyway i want to know what what you have to say because you're the yeah, one with sure. the yeah sure uh, i mean okay it's uh it is a lot cheaper up here uh so the price point for 3d renders uh is is quite low uh, okay so let's start with that how much yeah. do you guys 
or how much does the industry charge more or less for an image yeah. although it is hard to quantify because we know that it's uh, yeah okay so if you're talking about like a standard interior image you're probably talking around about the oh, at, at probably most 25,000 baht which is about a thousand dollars Australian so it's it's very cheap um, you could probably do like a bathroom render for you know half of that so you're talking about the the 12 to 15,000 baht uh, price range um, does it take four weeks to produce that? No. <laughs> so, um, but then again, you know, animation projects uh, are the same sort of thing. We have the same requirements that any other studio has. So we have, uh, you know, render farms that need looking after. We have power requirements that need to run those things. Uh, so th there's cost in power. Uh, it just is, is a lot cheaper to actually do it up here. Um, so therefore, the price points, every, everybody's very competitive, especially with the big developers up here. Uh, I had a meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago with one of the major developing uh, developers up here. And, uh, you know, they, they asked me flat out the, the same question you did. How, how, how much for your rendering charges? And uh, so I just gave them the same ballpark that I did for, did for you. I said, look, you know, for an interior image, you're looking at around about 25,000 baht. Uh, for an exterior image, you know, it might be double that, depending on the, the level of complexity. Uh, but you're not going much more than that, uh, simply because the comp competition to do it is, you know, if someone's got to wait an extra week and they can get it for 10,000 baht cheaper, well, they'll go for that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but then again, you've got Europeans uh, coming to Thai guys and or Thai studios and, you know, uh, getting stuff done but then we're also competing against the Chinese in the Indian market as well so I know uh, I, I have an Australian developer um, that I'm just about to start doing some work for and uh, he's got some quotes from some Indian uh, companies and he said oh you know th those renders were like a hundred dollars Australian and I said yeah okay off you go. <laughs> if, you, if you really, if you really want that sort of quality, um, but yeah, it, it does become sort of difficult when you know you've got clients coming to you and saying, "Oh, I can get work done elsewhere in Asia cheaper than what it's done for in Thailand." And it's like, well, Thailand's pretty cheap, uh, you know. And then I then I tell them about prices, you know, in Australia for the same sort of level of work. And they're like, they fall off their chair. They're like, oh, no, <laughs> we, we wouldn't pay that ever. So. Yeah, but this is also the thing. I mean, it, it, it always depends where you try to position yourself with, sure. with the type of service that you're providing. I'm now working on a, on a video which is about bridging the gap between, you know, the client coming asking for a service and the service itself because yeah. what has value it's everything which is in between and not no the end product you know because the end yeah. product you can literally find it for even less than a hundred dollars there are people that are incredible artists and they do super cheap renders and i'm like how do you survive and the answer is i don't survive yeah yeah exactly they and they don't and they come in and they will do one or two projects really well and then they'll taper off look i've worked with uh, some companies in vietnam and uh in indonesia who were supplying some you know renders on the side and the quality just drops like they do one or two great projects and then you know you start feeding them volumes of work and it just yeah, it completely crashes and they, they just can't keep up with it because and, and then you find out later that they've burnt themselves out doing the first two projects like and, and they can't keep the pace of doing it exactly uh, and, and, or, or, or they're burning out you know, you know junior artists which they're like sort of going yeah come on get this done get this done they're working 18 hour days and again they, they, they can't retain the staff or their staff just say no I'm not doing this anymore and get up and walk out <laughs> And I know a few studios where that's happened. So. Have you ever found yourself in a position where you thought you were about to burn out or maybe you burn oh, yeah, out? Absolutely. <laughs> um, so many times. So many times. Uh, I think actually um, 
when I first arrived at Deercrit, uh, I was creative directing a project and uh, we had an outsourcing partner that uh, completely dropped the ball on a project. And to, to keep the client happy and deliver the project on time, I actually worked a 42-hour day straight. I didn't go Jeez. home. I just sat in the office until the project was done. And it was like, okay. And then, uh, and then my director came in and he said, have you gone home? And I'm like, no, <laughs> not yet. And he's like, okay, go home, get a shower, get some breakfast, come back. <laughs> Jesus. But, I mean, you know, that, that was very rare, very, very, very rare. Um, look, it doesn't happen so much these days because uh, yeah, you've got things like distributive rendering that helps massively. Uh, back in the day when, you know, I was using single core machines with V-Ray, it was a different story. Yeah. So I've seen the evolution and... Uh, you know, we used to have a joke actually uh, at one of the other studios I was in in Sydney uh, back in the early days. Uh, I, uh, I used to have a sleeping bag actually underneath the table, and the guys would be like, "Did you sleep here?" And I'm like, "No, no, no, it's, it's just there for the boss to show up." But, yeah, maybe one day. <laughs> but I mean, certainly there's been times where you know you you have to just work the hours to get the projects done. Uh, keep the clients happy and uh, when the work's on the work's on and when it's not you sit back and you just you know you negotiate uh, days in lieu with your boss and say okay well whilst this project's on I'll burn myself out and then at the end of it I'm taking a couple of days off just to recuperate and you know, I've worked with a couple of studio directors who've done that in the past and they've been really good about it and they understand you know uh, need to take a break at the end of major projects and that's fine but um yeah, the, there's always been that one project where you just work till three o'clock in the morning to get it delivered, you know, that day. And um, you know, try you try not to do it anymore, but uh, something always happens. So that's the thing, <laughs> and you can never always breaks. I just wanna uh, hold on. I just wanna remind people watching because I see there is a a, a relatively big group of new guys coming in. Hi Drokis, hey Mike, what's happening? I care. Um, I wanna just, you know, uh, remind you if you have any questions, if you're interested in any specific aspect. T tonight we're talking about, you know, the archives industry in Thailand through the eyes of a, uh, a creative di director coming from Australia, which is to me still mind-blowing you know and I I want to ask you an, uh, uh, another couple of questions regarding this uh, uh, the fact that you're working as a director in Thailand this is not the first time that I see people coming from uh, abroad going to an Asian country to cover like some sort of a, a manager or like director role it seems mm. to be uh, pretty common that you know these companies uh, hire people from say America or Europe to cover yep. these leading positions is there a specific reason for that how is this happening so so often well I, I, I think it's uh, I, I think it's two things uh, one the guys that are coming here usually end up working for larger organizations so Deercrit for instance is a company of 500 staff uh, so it's a pretty big organization and it's also under the News Corp umbrella. So it, it, it's got some serious financial backing behind it as well. Wow, that uh, sounds now, like it. The company, the, the company doesn't just do 3D rendering. Uh, that's one component of it that it does. Um, they're very big in their residential uh, photography industry as well. So uh, they, they employ a lot of Thai staff to do the retouching as well. Mm -hmm. um, but to go back to sort of why uh, you're finding guys like myself coming to Asia, it's well, kind of one, it's a challenge, it's new, it's exciting, it's a great place to live, uh, it's, fairly, it, it's relatively cheap uh, for someone like myself coming from Australia to come and live in Thailand. Why we're not seeing, I guess, a lot of ties get to that level is because you'll see artists uh, that are very very good they they want to get out of thailand they want to go to the rest of the world so they're not working 
they, they might be they might be going work for big studios overseas and then come back at a later stage but at the moment we're in that uh, transition period where you get uh, all the very talented guys uh, even Woody is working for Gensler uh, you know so he, he's working for Gensler based here uh, in in Thailand which is amazing uh, yeah which is great uh, but you know the other guys like sort of at his level uh, would want to be sort of exploring the opportunities to say go down to Australia and work for Binyan or work for Flood Slicer or work for Mr. P Studios or uh, you know FKD or one of the guys down there that could offer an opportunity just to get some international experience and exposure I know uh, one of the other major guys uh, from Thailand here who has a, a, a school that he uh, he teaches Thai guys uh, rendering in V-Ray and Corona. He's working in Hong Kong. Uh, so he freelances from Hong Kong. He comes back down to Thailand every now and then, uh, does a couple of classes, but ma mainly based out of uh, Hong Kong so that he could uh, operate at sort of uh, uh, having that uh, international experience. Um, so I guess that's why you're not seeing a lot of guys uh, like Thai guys in creative direction roles or director roles is because they want to go and work for the, the big boys overseas before they come back and do that. I understand. This is very interesting. And I want to ask you, since you mentioned it, I know that uh, you, <clears throat> you have some plans of your own and I want to touch up on that as well. But yep. what about the, the teaching in, uh, in Thailand? Where do people actually uh, learn this kind of stuff? Are universities very active in 3D? Yeah, yeah the, the universities over here are very active, especially f uh, sort of the architecture schools. Um, they're, they're very active uh, for sure. But there's also a couple of great studios over here that actually do specific training co uh, courses like the ones in Italy. Uh, they have a similar sort of structure where they're teaching Max, V-Ray, Corona, uh, Forest Pro, uh, even uh, they're starting to touch on the Unreal Engine as well. So yes. uh, the, the, those schools are here, they're based, uh, I mean, Thailand is the fastest adopter of VR technology in the world. So th this, this is the country where... They, they picked up VR and just ran with it. And, and <laughs> there's companies over here like doing things that, you know, the guys are still like, well, I think VR might be a bit of a fad. Come to Thailand. It's not. <laughs> but there, there's so much adoption of VR uh, in this country. It, it's amazing. So, you know, you know you, you've got some very talented guys teaching some very talented courses here, uh, which is great. But it also means that once they actually get to a certain level, they go, I've got some great experience. I might go and see if I can get a job in the US or in England or in Australia. So uh, they don't sort of stick around. They were like, oh, I can make some more money by working for an international company. Which is amazing. And, you yeah. know, but I want to ask you because um, it seems to me like the economy in Thailand, it's also skyrocketing. Like there is a lot going on at the moment. So this is also a little yeah. bit of a... Yeah, the, it, it is. It's uh, it's definitely uh, growing here. Um, it's growing fast. Uh, I wouldn't say it's uh, like you know shooting right up. It was probably two years ago, like uh, yeah, going almost vertical. It seems to sort of uh, tapered out a little bit now, but uh, it's still very much a growth market over here. So, uh, it, like I was saying to you earlier before, is like yeah, a couple of years ago when I arrived. Uh, there was probably about uh, yeah, um, a quarter more condos have gone up in the last two years. Yeah, it's just it's unrecognisable from what it was two years ago. And the food industry here, restaurants pop open, uh, bar, new bars open every month. Uh, so there's you know the Thais love eating out Western food, Western bars. As much as they love their Thai food, they also love the Western stuff as well. So, uh, yeah, and, and that's what's also bringing all the expats over here uh, is because they can come and live in Thailand and they get the best of both worlds. Uh, I mean, I'm not missing really much apart from family and friends back home in Australia because I have pretty much everything else. I've got a decent, 
decent coffee shop over here. Um, it took a little while to find it, uh, <laughs> and it's an Australian-run uh, coffee shop, so that's that, that's also a plus. But as an Italian, that would have been my next question. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> where, where do I get a decent coffee? Not Starbucks. <laughs> but Zach, your last name sounds a little bit Italian. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I get that all the time. <laughs> but it's not. Uh, the, no, 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 not Italian. Um, Hungarian, German. Okay. Background, so, yeah, dad's dad was born in Germany, uh, but uh, then immigrated to Australia. So, uh, I, I'm a I'm a bitter. Uh, I've got uh, English, Irish, German, Hungarian, Aussie. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, you know. To be honest, when I was in uh, in uh, in Bangkok, man, I fell in love with that city. I don't know, there is something to it, you know. And now that you're really? telling me all these things, I'm like, oh, I want to go back. Yeah, no, it's it, it certainly has grown a lot, especially in the last two years since I've been here. I mean, their infrastructure is growing, uh, the economy is growing strong. Um, in general, I would say it's uh, yeah, it, it's all moving forward very, very well, um, and, and I'm I'm looking forward and I'm excited to see what happens here in the next couple of years as well. So, actually, yeah. that leads me to my next question, which is, yep. let's talk a little bit about your future because I know that there are some things happening. I don't know how yep. much you can share about these new things, but I would like um, to hear it. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm uh, leaving leaving Deercrit. Uh, I've I've had a wonderful two years uh, with the company, uh, but I've decided that uh, I've made some very good connections and very good friends over here, and uh, we as a group have decided that we're going to launch our own studio. Uh, so we're in the process of actually setting that up, and uh, uh, we actually officially launch first uh, of June. Uh, so, as long as my uh, w uh, web developer and branding guy actually gets me the logo, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm meeting him on Wednesday to finalise everything with that. So, um, so that's going to be my uh, my first first venture in uh, Bangkok with uh, with some, uh, a group of people, um, and we've got some very exciting projects uh, that we're launching with. So, um, looking forward to uh, some some very exciting things in uh, down at Phuket and also based around Bangkok. Um, and Is the office working. going to be based in Bangkok? Yes, yes it will be. And who so is going to be, how many people are in this? Uh, we've got a core group of about six people at the moment uh, in, involved in this. Uh, so it's just a small team to start with, uh, but uh, like it's a full end-to-end -end solution for developers uh, based out of uh, well we're targeting we're targeting sort of uh, the Asian market first uh, but then uh, you know I've also got some contacts down in Australia that uh, who contacted me and were very interested in sort of finding out about you know what I was doing um, and, and, and doing some projects together as well so we'll see what happens there but uh, the fir first the uh, first few projects we we have um, on the board at the moment, uh, definitely based in Bangkok. So, uh, looking forward to those. And they're uh, a mix of. Um, well, the first one is a, sort of a, a very high-end uh, luxury development based in Phuket, uh, and then we're looking at also some hospitality retail work, uh, because I've, I've I've had a fair bit of experience back in Australia uh, working on two of the biggest shopping centres. Uh, in Melbourne, uh, so I bring that uh, experience of working in those retail sector to uh, to Bangkok, and um, one of the main things that we're actually doing is VR in the retail and hospitality uh, industry. So it's going to be a mix of three um, three hundred and sixty degree video all the way through to Unreal Engine, full interactive uh, HTC Vive headsets and Oculus. And so yeah. We've got a great team to also put that all together, uh, and um, you know, we're, I, we're I really look forward to see what you guys are doing because it sounds also yeah. interesting, and also you know the fact that uh, Thailand is so advanced in the adoption of VR. Uh, I've seen some videos also online of things that you know are happening. 
like you know in malls and uh, uh, video games places you know where people just go and play and interact uh yeah. and you know it it's kind of tickling my creative uh you know cell inside my brain i i want to i want to see it you know i want to i want to yeah, see what it's yeah. happening and i, yeah. I uh, let me ask you, what about the logistics of setting up business uh, over there? Did you find any friction? Was it hard? Was it simple? No, it's uh, it's relatively simple. Uh, the only constraint is that uh, I, I can only own 49% of the actual company. So uh, even though my name is on the front door, uh, <laughs> I'm only a, a, a less than 51% uh, shareholder. So... Uh, the, the other 51% has to be owned by ties, and I'm fortunate that I've got two great business partners uh, to actually go into this new venture with. So uh, that, that's the only real constraint. Uh, other than that, um, for my work permit, we have to employ uh, as a minimum number of uh, four Thai staff. So, uh, But again, that's a, a very easy sort of thing to, to find and, and do because, again, the workforce here in Thailand uh, for 3D artists is great. Um, it, it's it's actually you know, very r relatively easy to find good artists um, that uh, that want to work on interesting projects. So, which is a, a very nice thing. <laughs> uh, other, otherwise, it might have been a little bit more difficult for me to get my work permit done. So, are you doing? Are you working in English seamlessly? It's not a problem, right? To to yeah, speak in English. So we, we we do all the communication in English, uh, but then I also because my two other business partners are Thai, uh, can speak Thai, uh, speak English, and also speak Swedish. Uh, they're multilingual. Um, you know, it, it makes it easy for me to communicate to like my other directors. Um, what it is that we we need to do and then we have team leaders underneath that that actually can go out and uh and, and manage the teams uh and it's it's been the same way working process uh at deercret as well uh most of the guys there uh, speak fairly good english so communicating with them is is easy uh but when it when their English is, becomes a little bit limited, we've got other staff that can step in and help with the translation or uh, whatever, help, help out with the, you know, getting things over the line. So, yeah, it's fine. This is all very interesting. And tell me another thing. I'm sorry that I'm, you know, uh, bothering you with all these questions, but, you know, this no, is okay. very interesting also on a very personal level. What about yeah. hardware and uh then later we'll talk also about software but hardware yeah. this will be my main first concern so, like are uh, prices very expensive because i remember when no, i didn't. when i went did to uh, bangkok i was surprised that things were so expensive mm. um I, I wouldn't say the over the top expensive there is certainly is the tax that's uh, put on technology here uh, so it is a little bit say more expensive than uh, back home in Australia to uh, to get some decent hardware um, but we can we can certainly negotiate on prices as well and uh, it ends up actually being around about the same sort of cost anyway uh, it, it might be just slightly more expensive for the hardware but you you're still getting the same quality uh, stuff you, you can certainly find things cheaper and, and get them shipped in but uh, <laughs> the logistics of getting them over the border is a bit more of a, a pain than it, it's worth. So you usually end up going uh, just across the road from where I actually live. There's a massive shopping mall. It's seven stories of all technical. Uh, it, it, the whole mall is dedicated to tech gear and hardware and software. So you can pretty much go in there and find what you want at a pretty reasonable price. Okay, because this I remember when I walked into... Uh it wasn't like a, a uh, an Apple store. It was sort of like a sur uh, surrogate. Yeah, they, don't have Apple, they, don't, they don't have Apple store uh, in Thailand. They do, they have iStudio, which is the Apple reseller. Okay. Uh, but again, the, the Apple, uh, even with the Apple prices, they're only sort of marginally higher than what they would be in any other country. Um, if you really wanted to do it, you could fly to Hong Kong or down to Malaysia get it slightly cheaper but 
by the time you get all that effort to do it, it yeah, it actually does yeah. make sense to do it. Uh, so. What what about software? Is software cheaper in comparison to say Australia? Well, with software being all online these days, um, you buying it through either Singapore or Australia or the US anyway, so it doesn't actually make that much of a difference. Um, so, so software is uh, exactly the same price as what uh, you know the guys in Australia are playing. Uh, so when we're licensing uh, 3ds Max uh, or V-Ray, uh, you know we're buying it directly from the authorized resellers of uh, Autodesk or we're buying it from the authorized resellers of uh, Chaos Group. So it, it ends up being exactly the same sort of prices. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm, just I'm asking you this because very yep. often some of the comments that you uh, read online is that, you know, people say, yeah, but you know, those companies, they just crack software, they don't use software. Whilst I'm, I personally think that, you know, to a certain point, if you're running a studio like that, you cannot really escape, you know, the, the part of having to buy software. Yep. And, you know, I have you now online, so I want you to kind of either confirm yeah. or dismiss this theory? Look, I think uh, years ago, definitely, uh, you know, uh, the piracy thing was a huge issue in, in through, throughout all of Asia. Uh, these days, from the people that I'm talking to, uh, er everyone's buying it. Uh, no one's going to the hassle of, you know, having to download or cr get crack software. Uh, all the studios that I've spoken to, not only uh, in uh, Thailand, but also down in Malaysia, in Indonesia, uh, in Vietnam, they're all purchasing uh, the licenses for everything because they just, at the end of the day, they realize the benefits of actually having subscriptions and, uh, and, and then being able to, like, when something goes wrong, jump onto a forum or go to their reseller and talk to them or, you know, uh, have their tech guys uh, try and find out what the issue is. And if you've got, like, a cracked version of Forest Pro and it throws up an error message and it's simply because it was, you know, a cracked version of it, it's just like, well, just go and buy Forest Pro. It's not that expensive. Uh, um, you know, okay, uh, auto, uh, like, Max is probably a little bit more expensive than probably what it should be on subscription, but... It's a tool. You're making money out of it. Um, yeah. But again, it's relatively inexpensive these days for studios uh, when you've got you know, uh, good clients that are willing to pay the prices that you charge. Uh, and that's the thing too, is you shouldn't be undervaluing your, your renderers to sort of say, okay, well, I can do a render for 100 bucks because I've got crack pieces of software. No. That's... Um, Go and, go and charge your clients actually the real price. Don't undervalue what it is that you're actually producing and then you know, run your business properly. Now, because, you know, the very often when I talk about it with people online, they say, no, no, but, you know, the $100 surrender is just for now because soon I'm going to charge more. Yeah. Like, no, 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 no. You're going to charge $100 now and you're going to charge $100 forever. Because it's a trap, you know, you think that you're going to get out of it. Yeah, they try and undercut everybody else so that they can get it, get the clients. And they think by undercutting people, they'll, they'll attract uh, more clients. And they, they will to a certain degree. But, you know, the quality studios that uh, I've seen in Australia, uh, some of the big guys there, they don't undercut each other. They have a fixed price for what they do. And it's like, if you don't want to pay it, you're happy to go somewhere else yeah. and you know and I've, I've seen time and time again clients go to one studio say oh no your price was too expensive they go somewhere else they get it done cheaper and then they come back to that other studio and say oh my renders were terrible can you please fix them and the studio says well uh, yes and our price is this and they're like oh but we just spent all this. well that's not our problem <laughs> Yeah, but so that's I, exactly I, the thing. It takes also yeah. a little bit of like uh, maturity to kind of make the client understand, you know, that this it's is very the... much client education. It is very much client education. It's one of the biggest things that I learned when I was a Binion is, you know, educating the client on why it is they do what they do. Um, 
and you know guys like Binyan and Mr P and uh, FKD they do it very well uh, they educate their clients on like you know this is our price for doing a 3D render we're going to do a great job on it but it's going to cost you X amount of dollars to, to produce that and we do that because you know we have staff to pay we have software licenses to pay but we're also not undervaluing what it is that we're producing for you and you know with more clients getting educated in that uh, it makes it easier for us to charge actually what it is to produce and make some money as a business um, by educating them and saying okay we're not, we're not going to undercut each other we're going to do it at this level and we're going to do it at this price and uh, if you don't like it well you're happy to go somewhere else but uh, you won't get what we can offer you and, know it's yeah, it's a uh, please, please go and then I'll add something. Yeah, I was just going to add, like, you know, and what it is that uh, studios are tending to do these days also is, you know, to keep clients and keep repeat business is they start value adding what they can do. So they might do 10 renders in a project, but they might actually throw in two or three, you know, cameo uh, vignette shots. Uh, for that client on a particular project because the creative director comes along and says, oh, actually, it'd be really nice to sort of, you know, focus on this little detail element uh, of the project. Uh, let's do a couple of renders, not only for the client, but also for the, the studio's portfolio. So, you know, that, that's, that's how you, or some, some of the guys are winning sort of repeat business. So. Now, you know, the probably the easiest way to put it also for people that are looking to do this job is that th your actual task is not as much as making renders as it is to educate clients because, you know, the renders are a consequence of you educating your clients. Of course, you know, you cannot yeah. do one without the other, meaning if you suck at making renders, don't expect that you'll be able to educate your client, you know? You can only yeah. educate your client if you have a proven track of what you're able to do and you do it well. And then at that point, yeah. you could say to the client, listen, this is how we do stuff. Don't get us wrong. It's just that if you go to a Ferrari shop and you ask for a Ferrari and you ask the guy to paint it with like polka dots, the guy's going to look at you and it's going to be like, do you understand that you're buying a car that is supposed to be the way we make it and not yeah. polka dots. And the guy will say, no, I want it polka dots. Okay, then it will cost you 100,000 more. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's, it's the same thing. I, I've got friends who are executive chefs and, uh, you know, <laughs> they they have, you know, people sending back food to the kitchen. Oh, I don't like it, this, this, this. And they walk out to the tables and say, listen, this is the food, this is how I prepare it, this is the way we serve it. If you don't like it, you're welcome to eat somewhere else. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> you know, I was working for, uh, before getting into archivists, I used to be a cook. And yeah. I worked for uh, a restaurant which was managed by Gordon Ramsay, or at least yeah. was under his lead, so to say. And there was this uh, sous chef which was like just like him you know he would yell at people he would yell at cooks he would yell and once i remember a client sent back uh, a fillet of um pork fillet because the fillet was a little bit pink and you know the the chef said you know this is a five star restaurant we don't serve you bad pork this pork yeah. is supposed to be like this now I'm saying it nice, but this guy, I could see the spit <laughs> coming out of his mouth in the face of this woman. It was terrible, man. But, you yeah. know, it kind of reminded me that this is how you do it. You know, you don't tell me how to do my job. I tell you how to do. Exactly. Obviously, exactly. you don't want to bridge the gap with violence and like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not, you're not screaming at your client. Definitely you want to do it in a, in a constructive way. We yeah, have yeah, Cine yeah. Software is actually tuning in. Uh, They're saying Nigel, hi. Probably. <laughs> probably. If it's Nigel, say hi. Uh, hi. Zach yeah, hi, and Nigel. Fabio, interesting topic. <laughs> Droke is had to leave. There is show it better online. Marcin, sorry if I answer only, uh, only now. 
Diacritus in Bangkok, right? I think there are more uh, offices. We, okay, so the head office is based in uh, Bangkok, uh, yes, but we have uh, office all through the Nordics as well, so in Nor Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Um, I think there might be a couple of others. Oh, uh, there might be a satellite office in the US. I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, but cer certainly the Nordic market, and, and Australia, of course, uh, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane. Uh, not, not for the 3D rendering part, mainly for the residential market uh, in the Australian market. Uh, but yeah, we, we are an international company. <laughs> oh, uh, sorry. Uh, I apologize, Martin. <laughs> I thought that you were saying here. I am sorry. I'm trying to keep to follow Zach as well as reading the 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 chat. He's asking if yeah. you guys are hiring, not if you're here in Bangkok. Oh, if, <laughs> if we're hiring, my yeah. mistake. Um, Yes, uh, there, there is open applications uh, for, for Deercrit. Uh, I believe Glassdoor has, uh, yeah, if you just do a Google search for uh, Deercrit Glassdoor, uh, Glassdoor is uh, one of the recruitment sites based here in Bangkok. So, And they, I believe they are actually looking for mid-level and uh, senior artists uh, to actually join the company. There you go. So you can have a, a, a beautiful job in a beautiful city. And is it is it, really, really, really awesome city to work in. <laughs> I really, I liked it. You know, when I went there, I was like, oh my God, I, I might really enjoy to, to live here and work here. But anyway, uh, in the weekend, do you have actually the time from work to go and say, visit Phuket or uh, go to the oh, south, sure. you know? Yeah, it's uh, look. It's very easy to get around. Uh, it, look, the but it's hours, more like for the work-life balance kind of. Uh, you yeah, know, we have a, we, we we. I mean, we have a very very good work-life balance. Uh, the guys, I think the earliest they start in the morning might be around about eight thirty, maybe nine o'clock. Uh, most guys don't come in before nine. Uh, by six, the six six thirty, most pretty much everyone's gone. So, you know, we're we're not sort of uh, our normal working hours are nine thirty to six thirty. Uh, to sorry, nine thirty till six. Uh, we take an hour for lunch. Uh, there's not a lot of overtime. Uh, we're we're pretty good on the efficiency of making sure that projects are uh, on time and that we don't have staff that are sitting back till. Uh, 11 o'clock at night working uh, only creative directors like me do that <laughs> <laughs> somebody no, has no to take a bullet for the team uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was uh, back in the early days where ha we had some crazy processes in place but those have been uh, ironed out now so uh, it's all good um, but uh, in terms of like the weekends yeah we uh, you know Six o'clock Friday, we're out the door. We might go and grab a beer sometimes. Um, otherwise, it's pretty easy to sort of jump in the car and drive down to Pattaya. It takes about, oh, if you leave early in the morning on Saturday, it'll take you maybe an hour and a half to drive down to Pattaya. Uh, you could jump on a plane, go to Phuket for the weekend or down to Krabi, no problems at all. And it's very, well, it's relatively cheap to actually sort of do those mm -hmm. sort of uh, things. You wouldn't do it every weekend, but uh, <laughs> yeah, certainly every every couple of months you could do it for sure. Uh, yes, that was actually, you see, Nigel was uh, spot on. I wanted to ask you, uh, Zach hasn't discussed it yet, archivist training in Bangkok. And this is something well. that... I wanted to ask you because you mentioned something to me. Mm. Um, okay, so you know that I did some training in Italy uh, back in 2013. I was the uh, first Australian to go and sort of do that. I, I don't actually think they've had another Aussie back. Uh, it's a little bit far away to go to all the way to Italy to, to go to the training uh, for a masterclass. But uh, yeah, um, I also did like uh, uh, because I was there for that first international class. Uh, I was the first Aussie to be a V-Ray certified professional, and I was like, "Yeah, okay, quite." Uh, 
Uh, and then I went back, uh, actually did two trips uh, to Italy that year. Uh, first one was to do the class and then I went back for the conference because Vlado was announcing V-Ray 3. Uh-huh. Uh, and so uh, I actually have a, fo- a photo. I'll, I'll have to send it to you. It's a, it's a great photo. It's actually a photo of me, uh, Peter Guthrie, uh, Bertrand Benoit, uh, Vlado, and two of the guys from Uniform sitting around the table having an open discussion, drinking beer, eating pizza, and it's, it's great. <laughs> I love it. Peter is a super nice guy. I met him, uh, yeah. I think, was great. Actually, last year. <clears throat> yeah. Um, just trying to think. Uh, who's the other guy that he opened the boundary with? Um, uh, Henry. Henry. Henry Goss, yeah. Um, yeah, I actually met Henry at that conference as well back in 2013 before the, the guys had started the boundary. So... Uh, Yeah, that, that, that was a, a great conference. Uh, but coming back from that, I was uh, wanting to do two things. Um, we tried doing the, the ArcViz conference in Australia uh, in 2014, VizCon. Uh, <laughs> we just couldn't get enough Aussie interest. Oh, uh, I think it. you guys maybe got in touch with us, actually. Touch. Yeah, I, uh, I did. Uh, I got in touch, I think uh, myself or uh, Dan actually got in touch with you and started talking about the offerings that we could do of training. Because um, were you with Flying Architecture at that point? Yes, I was still collaborating yeah. with them. Yeah. Right, right, right. So I think that's where we were having, uh, having you come down as part of Flying Architecture to actually do some stuff there, do some training. Uh, and we had, like, I'd used all my networks that I'd gone over and made in Italy to sort of pan out and sort of see who I could get. And I was talking to Carlos in, uh, at Neoscape about possibly coming down for the conference. And, and he was like, ah, oh, it's a bit hard for, for him to do it because of the, uh, the visa restrictions he's got. I was like, ah, yeah, all right. Uh, and then I started talking to... Um, the guys from Visual House and they, they were on board to sort of come down and we're like, okay, so we've got some really good speakers internationally to come to this thing. We just need some Australians to actually pay for it. And everyone was like, isn't it free? No. <laughs> oh, but, but Autodesk does them for free. Yeah, not anymore. <laughs> and so that, that very quickly was like, Yep, no. And then I remember actually that same year, Jeff Model tried to do the one in Canada. And I was like, yeah, okay, great. Uh, he did the, uh, the Kickstarter uh, fund to get it off the ground. And that one did go as well. And it was like, yeah, um, it was problematic. You know, people... it's, it's not as simple as people think to do. To... Exactly. I mean, setting up conferences is very, very expensive. Um, you have to. You tell me, out. man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you, you seen the D2 conference has become a monster? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. this year we're expecting like 400 people, which is amazing of course yeah that's great but it's uh it's a it's a 40 hours uh 40 hours a week job yeah oh i know i mean i was uh, at the time that we were setting up that conference i just started in a new role as creative director and i was like oh my god uh trying to run a team trying to run a conference it was a nightmare <laughs> and i was like uh, uh, after that like because Um, Dan and I had gone to the RTC conferences speakers back in 2010 uh, and we would develop, uh, we were, did a white paper on actually um, doing a, a, a pipeline process back then uh, of getting Revit models into 3ds Max mm-hmm. because it wasn't a straight thing. You couldn't just open a Revit model yeah. in Max. You had to go through this uh, conversion and you had to do a, a whole lot of... Uh, jumping through hoops to actually get it into into Max. Uh, and then you had to convert everything f- uh, to standard materials in Revit. You couldn't use Revit materials. Oh, it was just a nightmare. <laughs> But, you know, following from that, we, we kind of went, okay, wouldn't it be cool to do like a, a, a mini conference? And so we did one in 2011. Uh, the following year, we, we went to Wollongong. We did one day. We were invited at a... We got uh, Lon Gross, who at that stage, he was uh, still at Neoscape. So he was the creative director at Neoscape. And uh, we got him down to Australia and we got him in to do like a, a talk. 
and uh, that uh, after that day, uh, Long, myself, and a couple of other guys, we ended up going out partying till like you know, stupid o'clock in the morning, drinking copious amounts of beer, talking about V-Ray in the future, because he was, I think he was in talks with chaos group might have been at that stage and so he was like oh yeah i think i might be leaving the escape and going to chaos group I was like, oh, okay cool and then um yeah th- that did happen and uh <laughs> and then we thought oh, yeah. after i went to italy I thought, yeah okay great let's do the let's do the conference we had fun doing viz day and we thought we could get the numbers but no unfortunately not but uh so that, that, that was one. And then the second thing that came out of me going up to Italy uh, for both the, the training and the, and the conference was uh, you know, me recognizing that there was a very big hole uh, in Australia or in Southeast Asia for ArcViews training. Uh, specifically, you know, um, the photography-based ArcViews training. Because when you do ArcViews training at university level, they're teaching you from the architect's perspective, not yeah. from the photographer's perspective. So if you were doing, and I think Martin actually touched on this when you were talking to him last week, um, you know, the guys that are doing like the really awesome sort of uh, rendering uh, and, and producing awesome uh, stuff are the guys that are based, basing their work in photography. They're doing great composition. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're going out and, and learning how to actually shoot properly and then coming back and applying that because you've got one-click solutions like Corona. Um, you can pretty much do the same sort of thing in V-Ray these days anyway. Um, so really, it comes down to, you know, set the lights at default, set the you know, materials at, at whatever, and then just set the composition, and click the button, and you're ninety percent the way there, yeah. and then it just comes down to making sure that you've got uh, good quality materials, good quality models. Uh, you know, making sure that your architecture is not changing every five minutes. And uh, Th- you're this is really putting people in a position where, if yeah. you're good at what you do, then you can really show it. You know, because it's yeah. not about the technical things anymore. But uh, no, hold on. Let me I mean, just uh, let me just ask a yes or no question. Are you yeah. thinking to start a school now, as well as a three D business? We have a plan to do that. Yes. Ah, that's that gets me excited. So, I love when people um, do this stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I'm talking to a couple of key people uh, to help me sort of uh, get that up and running and uh, and what that means. Um, I can't say who is involved, uh, but uh, there have been some people that have reached out to me or reached back out to me and said, oh, I heard you're doing this. Um, that sounds very interesting. Uh, Pe- people from I where? <laughs> um, around the world. <laughs> okay, I can tell you one thing. I can tell you a little secret of mine. Mm-hmm. I have signed an NDA for something that will happen in Australia. Okay. Awesome. And hopefully it will be a big thing that will happen. Okay. Then wh- when we're not live, I'm going to tell you a little bit more, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really not allowed to say anything. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's fine. I mean, like I know that uh, Andre uh, has been a big advocate uh, from Binyan uh, about like getting some training happening down in Australia, especially with the amount of artists that uh, Binyan employs. Um, uh, they're always looking for new talent and uh, they've got a great talent base. Um, they're an expanding company and they're amazing uh, at looking and uh, and uh, enroll talents with them you know yeah yeah that, that they're very good at it uh but i i know like uh it was always like sort of an idea from andre's right from the beginning to have some sort of uh giving back to the community by approaching the universities and and having some sort of collaboration with Binyan and mm-hmm. uh, the universities to get training off the ground in Australia. The problem is it's just, it's very expensive to do it down there. So um, 
I wanted to do something similar down in Australia back at the end of 2013 when I came back. And I, I looked at the the initial setup costs and like, you know, I knew what State of Art Academy was charging in Italy and I kind of went, well, okay, can I make the price point similar to sort of what it is that they're doing up there um, without having guys have to fly all the way to Italy? Because... Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it cost me, oh, I had a bit of a holiday as well when I went up, so I went to Prague for a few days beforehand, but I mean, that's relatively cheap. But State of Art Academy cost me around about five, around about 7000 Australian dollars for me to actually go up there mm-hmm. and do the, the actual course, uh, and that was out of my own pocket. Um, you know, I was paying for that myself. I had to take holidays for five weeks uh, to do it. My, you know, my boss at the time he was very generous and sort of let it, allowing me to do that. Um, but you know, I was still <laughs> paying for it out of my own pocket, and it was like, oh, this hurts. Um, you know, and if I could have done that training in Australia uh, for a month, it would have been uh, a quarter of the cost. Uh, but unfortunately, we didn't have anything like that. We didn't have the facilities uh, down there. There was no V-Ray certification, uh, mm. and even Chaos Group at the time were only running the training either out of uh, you know places like uh, SOA or or out of uh, Bulgaria, uh, sorry, uh, out of Sofia. Yeah. Uh, or I think uh, I think they were only the only two training places that I knew of, really. Uh, it, and I know now that they do VRA days and they, they've gone down there a few times and, and done the certification that they do one days. Uh, but VRA certification is one thing, but the whole training program uh, that Masterclass was, I there's things in there that I learned uh, by having the time and the freedom to play around as an artist for like a, a month. Uh, you one of the big things that they did straight away was we got a camera. We went out walking around with the SLR camera, shooting for a day and looking at composition and then having an architectural photographer come back in and critique our photographs and give us pointers. And uh, so that was, you know, the first thing that they did. They said, okay, base everything in photography. Yeah. Don't worry about like the technical side of things. You can work that out later. Uh, Go and learn good composition. Learn about light, shadow, directions. Uh, learn about um, contrast. Mm. In and uh, you know, I uh, we, that first day we had six people uh, walking around, you know, with with our cameras, taking shots, and I think the shot uh, that I actually did ended up. We had like a little mini competition. And uh, it was kind of voted by the uh, the uh, architectural photographer is like, you know, this was the best shot, it's the winner. Okay. It took me about 30 seconds to actually take the shot because I was walking around, I was doing what pretty much everybody else was doing. I was looking, looking at the building, looking at uh, architectural elements and trying to think of, you know, something unique and different. And I ended up uh, just taking my camera and sticking it you know, vertical against the, the glass and shooting up the window. And right at that time, because the weather was up and down all day that day, it, like it started to rain and then the sun came out and then it started to rain again and we got some patches of blue sky. And I had this shot that had this perfectly timed shadow where it almost divided the shot, uh, the, the actual photograph in half and it mirror reflected the sky uh, in it and it was just like this perfect shot and I couldn't do it in a million years even if I sat there for an hour I would not be able to replicate that shot that I just was like "Uh, I'm sick of this click done (laughs) (laughs) but isn't that how some of the most uh, successful projects are actually made (laughs) Pretty much, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very much that. So. Like you know, you just Zach. I just wanna, yeah. I just wanna bring it to your attention. We've been talking for an hour and fifteen minutes. 
<laughs> usually, usually, you know, like after 45, 50 minutes, I start to look at the at the watch because, you know, we got to slow it down and now we need to close it. But here I just got, you know, very lost in the conversation. Damn, one hour and 15 minutes. People want to go to Man. sleep. <laughs> Dude, listen, I'll be happy yeah. to continue this conversation if you ever come to Vienna at the D2. Yeah, sure. We'll have yeah. a great time. Definitely. Uh, for now, I just have to cut it because yeah, we're no, way overboard with the time. I just want to thank you so much for doing this. No, and thank I want to thank you for the opportunity to do it. Uh, and I also want to thank people from home uh, for watching. If people want to reach you, where can they find you? Um, okay, I'll, I'll I'll send you a couple of links, and then you can put them into the okay the bottom. Uh, of you the know, video. before I get to it, you can even write it in a comment under the video, and okay. it will be faster than me editing this because it will take me a little bit of time to to go back to it. Uh, yeah. People seem to be very happy. I'm reading the 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 com the the comments. Um, Nigel says thanks, chaps. Uh, I think this was a very entertaining talk, and I I am sorry that I went so personal asking you all these questions. No, 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 it's fine, it's fine, not a problem at all. But I think you know the topic was really, really cool. Anyway, yep, I want to sure. thank you again. I'm gonna stop the streaming. Don't go anywhere because I want to yep. say thank you uh, uh, face to face, guys. Sure. Thanks a lot for watching, and I will see thanks, you guys. in two days. I'm gonna have another live with uh, Taron from uh, uh, Woods Bagot. And this will also be a very interesting talk for you guys. So, good night.